Lecture 31b of differential equations in linear algebra is about some pretty high level theorems in linear algebra. We'll start by quickly reviewing the orthogonal decomposition theorem, best approximation theorem, and Graham-Schmidt process that I talked about in lecture 30b. New stuff includes symmetric matrices, the spectral theorem, and an application to what's called a positive definite quadratic form. So a lot of pretty advanced stuff. As I talked about in lecture 31a, we want to be satisfied with applying these ideas to examples. And when we apply them to examples, it definitely can be understandable, though you do need to still work at it. All right, first few slides are review here. I'm going to go through it pretty quickly. I talked about this in lecture 30b. Orthogonal decomposition theorem says this. Given any subspace W of Rn, for the sake of imagination, maybe pretend we're talking about R3. This is a picture I drew last time as well. W some subspace, say, of R3. It's going to be maybe a line through the origin, maybe a plane through the origin. Let's pretend it's a plane through the origin. There's W. Given any Y in Rn, in R3, in lecture 30, B, I think I drew it over this way, and let me draw it over this way in lecture 31B. Given any vector y in, in this case, R3, that is not necessarily in the plane, and if you pick it randomly, it won't be, then you can write it uniquely in the form y hat plus z, where y hat is in w, and z is in the orthogonal complement of w. The orthogonal complement of a two-dimensional plane in three-dimensional space through the origin would be aligned to the origin that's perpendicular to the plane. That would be the orthogonal complement. The projection of y along w might look like this. That could be y hat. The hat notation is standard. It's often used in statistics problems especially. And the other vector, the z vector, is in this other subspace. This picture is not very good. <laughs> Maybe I should draw the projection over here like this more. I mean, you can't really draw these things perfectly without perspective anyway. But z would be in the w perp, the orthogonal complement of w itself. And if you draw it really nice, it's pretty clear that you would end up with a with a rectangle actually here, and by the parallelogram law, it would be clear that y would be the sum of these two things. The formula for y hat involves projections. These are projection vectors, as we've talked about before. And the formula for z is very simple. It's just y minus y hat. That will automatically make y equal to y hat plus z. The only thing left to prove is that z is actually in w perp, which means you need to, you need to check that z dotted with any of these other x vectors is zero, and that definitely can be checked. The vector y hat is called the projection of y onto w, sometimes written with projection notation. Also note, if, w, if y starts in w, then y hat actually equals y itself. This is related to the best approximation theorem. Let w be a subspace, like this plane for the origin. Given any vector y in R3 in this case, say like this one, this projection vector, this y hat, thinking of it as a point, is this point, I say, is the closest point in this plane to this point up here that could represent y itself. y has the unique vector in the plane closest to y itself. Give me any other vector v, it's going to be further away. The norm of the difference of two vectors gives you the distance between them. As arrows, if you put the, the uh, tails at the origin, it would be the distance between their tips. If you think of those as points, it would also be the distance between those points. That's less than y, the distance between y and v for any other v that is distinct from y hat in w. This is useful, as I mentioned in the last b lecture. Not only in these kinds of problems and in statistics, not only with these kinds of pictures, but also in more abstract vector spaces that have what's called an inner product defined, and we're trying to find best approximations, for example, to functions. We could be talking about a function space, and this is, again, related to Fourier series and partial differential equations, as we will see. This is also review. It's the next slide after this that's new. 
Suppose you got an orth orthonormal basis for a subspace W. So these vectors are not only orthogonal to each other, they're also normalized, they have unit length. Then you can simplify the formula for the projection vector is what this is all about. And that's because u dotted with u1 dotted with u1 is 1, u2 dotted with u2 is 1, etc. That's why you can simplify it. And if you define a matrix u to be have these columns, you can check. I'll leave it to you to check that the projection can be written this way. Okay? It is related to the formula for the projection, so I would encourage you to think about that. The Graham-Schmidt process, which we will use in an application later in this lecture, says that given any basis for a subspace W, doesn't have to be orthogonal. In fact, the point of the Graham-Schmidt process is to create an orthogonal basis. An orthogonal basis V1 through Vp for the same subspace W can be found via the following formulas. I talked about this in lecture 30A in the context of a two-dimensional example, so we only needed the first formula, which is very simple, and the second one. I drew a picture to illustrate it, but it can be applied to higher dimensional systems if W is a p-dimensional subspace of Rn, where p is less than or equal to n, and you've got a basis for it, you can create an orthogonal basis. Once you've got an orthogonal basis, you can also create an orthonormal basis, too, by taking all these v vectors and dividing by their non-zero lengths. Okay, and we will do that in our application. All right, so now is the new stuff. Symmetric matrices and the spectral theorem. This is important for lots of applications. <clears throat> One big application area that comes up is statistics again. For us, we will apply it in this lecture actually to understanding an example quadratic form. And that kind of quadratic form that we talk about soon is actually related to differential equations. We can make relationships between this stuff and differential equations too, for certain special situations at least. I actually already talked about symmetric matrices in the context of an example, a two by two example, back from lecture 27b. Now we're discussing the general theory and again applying it to a quadratic form example. First of all, definition. A matrix A is symmetric if it equals its transposed. Such a matrix would necessarily have to be square. I didn't have to put the word square in there. If that's true, it's going to be a square matrix, n by n. We've also defined this before, a square matrix, and again, that doesn't have to be there, is orthogonal if P transpose is P inverse. And if that's true, P would necessarily have to be a square matrix. P transpose equals P inverse, and P must be a square matrix. Note, such a matrix will necessarily have orthonormal columns, and in fact, even orthonormal rows, It'll be like one of those U matrices, well, that you saw on the previous slide, <clears throat> with the property that U transpose times U is the identity matrix. And if you do it the other way around, U, U times U transpose was, well, at least times Y was the projection of U along the subspace spanned by the columns of U. And if U happens to be square, that actually is going to be the identity function if u happens to be a square matrix. And so you really get the identity matrix times y again if u happens to be square. Okay? I think it's a bit of a mystery why it's not called an orthonormal matrix. That probably would be better terminology, but we're stuck with it. Orthogonal matrices, they're transposed as the inverse, which is really good because it helps you compute the inverse very easily. You just take the transpose, which is a very easy operation. And um, it does mean it has orthonormal columns and orthonormal rows. Theorem, if A is a symmetric matrix, then any two eigenvalues, vectors, excuse me, from distinct eigenspaces are orthogonal. Got an eigenspace for one eigenvalue and another eigenspace for another eigenvalue distinct eigenspaces, and you take any two vectors in those eigenspaces, those distinct ones, take the dot product, you'll get zero. The spectral theorem takes this theorem and broadens it. This theorem is actually part of the bigger spectral theorem. Spectral theorem 
for symmetric matrices, there are other spectral theorems. This is the easiest spectral theorem. Let A be an n by n symmetric matrix. We're implicitly assuming A has real entries, by the way. You could certainly talk about complex symmetric matrices, but we're not going there. We're assuming A is a real matrix, real entries. But it's symmetric, it transposes itself. We'll show you an example here, a couple examples. One example before the quadratic form example, we'll look at as a three by three case. Then, there's four parts. A has n real eigenvalues counting multiplicity. No non-real eigenvalues. No complex non-real ones. If you think of a real number as being at a complex number, its imaginary part is zero. You could say n eigenvalues, n complex eigenvalues with zero imaginary part, but it's simpler just to say real eigenvalues. But they could be multiple. B, the dimension of each eigenspace for each eigenvalue, the geometric multiplicity of the eigenvalue equals its algebraic multiplicity as a root of the characteristic polynomial. That's really nice. It's going to mean symmetric matrices are diagonalizable. But you can say even more. The eigenspaces are mutually orthogonal. This is essentially the same as this. And A is orthogonally diagonalizable. I mentioned that back in lecture 27B for the example. What does that mean? It means your change of coordinates matrix P is orthogonal. It's transposes its inverse. And we can write P transpose times A times P is diagonal. There exists an orthogonal matrix P whose transpose is its inverse. So that P transpose times A times P is diagonal. Usually when we diagonalize, we write a P inverse there. But hey, with orthogonal matrices, P inverse equals P transpose, so I can use P transpose as well. I could write a P inverse, but I can use P transpose. That's a simpler concept and simpler to compute for sure. Okay, so we're about to look at an example of this in a three by three case. After that example, we'll go into the quadratic form example which was going to have more direct application to differential equations. Here's the example. Orthogonally diagonalize this 3 by 3 matrix. Notice it is a symmetric matrix. It's transposed as itself. If you take the first row, make it the first column, you get the same thing as the original first. Or take the, take the first column, make it the first row, you get the same thing as the original first row. Take the second column, make it the second row, you get the same thing as the original second row. Take the third column, make it the third row, you get the same thing as the original third row. Another way to think about this is you have symmetry across the main diagonal. These two numbers match up, these two numbers match up, and these two numbers match up. This is another way to think about what it means for a matrix to be symmetric. E stuff. Going to compute the eigenvalues and eigenvectors. They turn out to be fairly simple for this example. I, you have to pick special examples to make them simple. Ready? Here's the characteristic polynomial in all its glory. You can check all this work. You can factor it like this. Negative lambda minus 7 quantity squared times lambda plus 2. Actually, some people define the characteristic of poly the polynomial to be the determinant of lambda i minus a instead of a minus lambda i. And in that case, the negative sign in front would not be there. But for our definition of the characteristic polynomial, it is. But it doesn't affect the roots. The roots, the eigenvalues are 7 and negative 2, either way you do it. <clears throat> negative 2 has multiplicity 1. 7 has multiplicity 2. I purposely wanted that to happen. Because I want you to see the truth, the truth of the spectral theorem. The eigenspace corresponding to this eigenvalue 7 of multiplicity 2 is two-dimensional. That's not guaranteed in the general case. It could be one dimension. But with symmetric matrices like this, it's got to be two dimensional. That's part of the spectral theorem. So here's the calculations to compute the eigenvector corresponding to the eigenvalue negative 2. Notice we've got um, 
5, 8, and 5 along the main diagonal before we have the augmented part. 3 minus negative 2 is 5. 6 minus negative 2 is 8. 3 minus negative 2 is 5. The other numbers stay the same. Again, we're trying to solve an, uh, a homogeneous system. You get a row of zeros. You get a free variable. Z is a free variable. X would be negative Z. Bring that to the other side of the equation. Y would be negative 1 half times Z. So if you pick Z to be 2, that means X is negative 2 and Y is negative 1. X is negative Z. Y is negative 1 half times Z. For the eigenvalue 7, you get this. And when you row reduce, you get two rows of zeros. And that's good, because it means there's going to be two linearly independent eigenvectors. This line will say x plus 1 half y minus z equals 0. So x will be negative 1 half y plus z. x is negative 1 half times y, and x equals z. Here we're taking z to be 0. Here we're taking y to be 0. That's OK. It gives us two linearly independent eigenvectors. These are not scalar multiples of each other. They will form a basis for the eigenspace corresponding to the eigenvalue 7. And it will be two-dimensional. Notice these green vectors are orthogonal to the blue vector. Take the dot product. V1 with V2, you get 0. V1 with V3, you get 0. Double check that. Yes, you do. However, V2 and V3 are not orthogonal. They, would, they, they don't have to be. However, if we want to make an orthogonal matrix P, we would want to make them orthogonal. We'd like to find a, an orthogonal basis for the subspace spanned by V2 and V3, which would be a plane through the origin. Hey, that's what Graham Schmidt is for. Here's what Graham Schmidt gives. Instead of V2 and V3, we have V2 prime and V3 prime, though V2 prime is the same as V2. There's the formula from the Graham Schmidt process. I'm using 2 and 3 instead of 1 because I'm talking about that eigenspace. There's the vector you get. And as a linear combination of V3 and V2, it will be in the subspace spanned by V2 and V3. It will be in the same plane to the origin. And it is orthogonal. V, V3 prime is orthogonal to V2 prime. These two vectors take the dot product. You get negative 4 fifths plus 4 fifths plus 0 is 0. That's an orthogonal basis for the eigenspace corresponding to the eigenvalue 7. So what, is our P and, what are our P and D matrices? And how can I write A as a product? P times D times P inverse, which could also be written D is P transpose. Well, A is P times D times P transpose. But I could also write D is P transpose times A times P. There they are. I, I forgot to mention, I also normalize these basis vectors. So V1, you can see what would be its norm, its square root of this squared plus this squared plus this squared. 4 plus 1 plus 4 is square root of 9 is 3. So I'm dividing those numbers by 3s. V2 prime has norm square root of 1 plus 4 is square root of 5. So I'm dividing all those by square root of 5, these two things. And 0 divided by square root of 5 is 0. And the norm of this thing, um, I mean, I can figure it out quick, but turns out to be such that when you divide this vector by its norm, you get these numbers. By the way, you can leave the roots in the denominators. You do not have to rationalize the denominators here. You can leave them in the bottoms of the fractions. That's often easier because you can make mistakes rationalizing the denominator. Notice the D matrix, the eigenvalues are on the main diagonal, negative 2 and then 7 twice. Is this useful? That's not clear. Certainly, we've seen diagonalization is useful before. And certainly, if P inverse equals P transpose, that's useful because P transpose is so easy to compute. So in that sense, it's really useful. We're going to see other applications, though, too. All right, two more slides. Our application to quadratic forms. What's a quadratic form? Definition. Quadratic form on Rn is a function q from Rn to, to R, not Rn to Rn, Rn to R. 
It's how it puts are real numbers. Whose formula can be written using a matrix, a symmetric matrix, in fact. Q of x is Q transpose times A times x, where x is assumed to be a column vector. So x is n by 1. So x transpose will be a row vector. It'll be 1 by n. And A is an n by n matrix. So you can definitely do this product, and the final result is a 1 by 1 matrix, which is a number. And you don't need square brackets or parentheses around it. The output of this is a number. A has to be symmetric for this to be a quadratic formula. Do not use an arbitrary matrix. If we have time in the next lecture, we'll talk about why. Here's our example. We'll do a two by two example. Let A be this symmetric matrix. Any numbers on the main diagonal is fine, but these numbers on the off diagonal have to match to make this symmetric. Yes, if you swap the columns with the rows, you get the same matrix back. Let's figure out the corresponding quadratic form for first. Plug A into here. What do you get? When you simplify, you get this function here. This is the final formula for the quadratic form in the simplest form. You can write it as x transpose ax first, but plug in A, do the matrix multiplications, you get a one by one matrix, just write it as a number, don't put parentheses around it. It's fine. Double check these calculations. Okay, so that's a quadratic form. What are some applications of this? We won't talk about differential equations applications in this lecture, but that will be in the next lecture or two. Probably, yeah, maybe some in the next one. But before that, we can talk about another application, an analytic geometry slash multivariable calculus question of interest, with, which will have ap applications to ordinary differential equations. To answer this question, what are the level sets of this function? Level sets being curves, sometimes called level curves, where the function is constant. It's actually better to call them level sets because they're not always curves. Could be the empty set or it could be just a point. If you put all these level curves together, what does the contour map look like? Now, if you've had multivariable calculus, hopefully you've thought about these things before. This is a multivariable calculus function, a real valued function of two variables. You can graph it as a three-dimensional graph, or you can look at what are called slices of that three-dimensional graph with horizontal planes that give you curves. In spite of the negative sign right there in this simplified formula for the quadratic form, turns out this quadratic formula, form, Q, is never, never negative in output. That might seem unexpected since you have a negative sign in there. You might wonder why. Why are its outputs never negative? What do the level sets look like? They look like skewed ellipses, rotated ellipses, when the output C is positive. When C is zero, then it's just the origin. When C is negative, then these level sets are the empty set. So these are skewed ellipses, ro rotated from the usual kind of orientation. And the red one that's highlighted is when C is 50, when the output of this function is 50, all the points on this red skewed ellipse are points that when you plug in the x and y coordinates into this expression, you get 50. You know, this point, for example, right there is close to x is 3.5, y is 0. 3.5 squared times 4 should be close to 50. Hopefully it is. I'll try to make a calculator. 3.5 squared times 4 is 49, okay? So yes, close to 50. We want to know why it looks like this. And why is it never negative? It's called positive definiteness. You might call it never negative definiteness. Positive definiteness of Q, not, not all quadratic forms are positive definite. This one is. This one never has negative outputs. Some do. One way to verify that Q is never negative is with multivariable calculus optimization. If you haven't had multivariable calculus, it's, it's okay. You can still listen to what I say here. It's still probably worthwhile. We want to optimize. We want to take derivatives, set them equal to zero, find critical points, and see if those critical points give us a min, max, or saddle point in higher dimensions. 
Take the partial derivatives with respect to x and with respect to y. What do you get? When you differentiate with respect to x, you treat the y as a constant. That differentiates the weight to 0. This differentiates to 8x minus 4y, because the y is constant. Differentiate with respect to y, you get negative 4x plus 14y. Like that. Set both derivatives equal to 0. Solve for x and y. You've got a two-dimensional linear system if you do so. And these, the matrix, matrix for the system would not be, um, not have two rows that are multiples of each other. Its determinant would be non-zero. It would be invertible, and in fact, the only solution is the origin, trivial solution. That's the unique critical point for the Q function. Is it a max or a min, though? Or maybe a, some sort of saddle point, whatever that means. You need a second derivative test. Find the second partials. Differentiate this thing with respect to x again, you're going to get 8. Differentiate this thing with respect to y again, you're going to get 14. Find this second order partial, which is called a mixed partial, means to either differentiate this with respect to y or this with respect to x. Either way you do it, you get the same answer, negative 4. You end up putting these numbers into a matrix. Is it the Jacobian matrix? No, it's called the Hessian matrix. It's got a different name. Put this number into the upper left corner. Put this number into the lower right corner. And put this number both into that spot and that spot. And hey, the Hessian matrix is symmetric. Because this has to equal the other mixed second order partial when you do it the opposite direction. By the way, this notation means differentiate with respect to y first, then with respect to x. This one means differentiate with respect to x first, then with respect to y, or right to left. But you get the same answer, which will be always true when your function is nice. Uh, that's got positive determinant, which means it can't be a saddle point. The origin cannot be a saddle point in a multivariable calculus sense. The fact that the second derivative with respect to x twice is positive, and, and that one's positive as well, is enough to say that this point is a local min point. And in fact, it's actually a global min point. The, the second derivative test only guarantees local extreme points. But in fact, because this is a quadratic function, it's, it's got to be a global min. And in fact, the output of q at the origin is 0. That is the minimum value of the function, 0. And it occurs at the origin. Another way to verify the Q is never negative is with a change of variables, coordinate change. This is more related to linear algebra. Orthogonal diagonalization. What are the eigenvalues of A? We want to orthogonally diagonalize A to, to figure out what our change of coordinates is. What are its eigenvalues? You can check it's 3 and 8. Go ahead and take the time to check it. Corresponding eigenvectors that are orthonormal are these two. So I purposely picked them to be orthonormal so that my P matrix will be orthogonal. Now I'm going to take those and put them in a P matrix right there and do the change of variables, change of coordinates, x equals PU. When I wrote that kind of equation before, it was capital Y equals PU, but now I'm calling my vector little x. So there's how the old coordinates depend on the new. The new coordinates depend on the old by being u is p inverse times x. But hey, p is orthogonal, so it's also p transpose times x. These two matrices in blue and red are transposes of each other. p itself is not, not symmetric. It's orthogonal. question is, what does the equation for the quadratic form look like in the new coordinates? And these are rotated coordinates. The u and v axes are a rotation from the x and y axes to a slanted or skewed coordinate system where the u axis is parallel to the long direction of the ellipse called the semi-major axis sometimes, and the v axis is parallel to the shorter direction of the ellipse. And because of that, the equation for the quadratic form 
becomes simpler, there are no cross terms, so to speak. No U times V terms. Here are the details. Not writing what the input is, because that could get confusing since I'm using both x and y. I'm just calling it q is 4x squared minus 4xy plus 7y squared. Replace every x with this row dotted with that vector. 2 over root 5u minus 1 over root 5v. Replace it there and there. Replace every y with this row dotted with the vector 1 over root 5 times u plus 2 over root 5 times v here and here. Take the time to square it all out, multiply it all out, expand it and simplify. A bunch of stuff cancels. You're left with 3u squared plus 8v squared. No cross terms. No u times v terms either with a plus sign or a minus sign. That definitely can never be negative. It's always greater than or equal to zero for all u and v that are real numbers. And more than just having no cross terms, look at the coefficients, 3 and 8. Same as the eigenvalues. Not a coincidence. The eigenvalues both being positive is another reason this quadratic form is positive definite. It can never be negative. Now you might wonder, is this really the same function? Yes, but with different coordinates. The formulas here and here are different formulas. And if you're only thinking about those formulas in terms of pure numbers that are plugged in to get outputs, they're actually different formulas. But as functions defined on the plane with respect to two different coordinate systems, given any point in the plane, if you know it's x, y coordinates and compute this, and you know it's uv in coordinates and compute this, you'll get the same output. So you need to think of these as functions defined on the same plane of points, just with different coordinate systems, to realize they really represent the same function in those different coordinate systems. That's the last slide. I'll end by showing you a little bit of Mathematica. With this here. A little bit of Mathematica, I should say. Um, real quick, here's the orthogonal diagonalization for the three-dimensional example. And this stuff was just to help me do my calculations and check them. You see the eigenvalues are 7 and 7 and negative 2, and these are the corresponding eigenvectors that are not normalized and also not orthogonalized with the Gram-Schmidt process with these, these two. This is was doing row reductions to get the answers for the eigenspaces. Uh, this is the P matrix and the D matrix, and you can compute P inverse there and see that it's the transpose of P. This matrix down here is the transpose of P itself, confirming that P is an orthogonal matrix. If you do P times D times P transpose, you do get the original A matrix back. Um, I'm going to skip that stuff. Let's look at the quadratic form stuff here. The eigenvalues are 8 and 3. Here's the quadratic form. Extra curvy braces around it. I just, yeah, it's better to write it like this to, to avoid the curvy braces. Here is a graphic of the level curves called the contour map. And I'm allowing myself through manipulate to change the value of C here, to change the level curve that I'm on. The C changes, I get a different level curve, but they're always ellipses. And they all, always have the same semi-major axis direction this way, and same semi-minor axis direction about like that, no matter what C is. Okay? And this is confirming the formulas and expanding this thing to simplify the formula in terms of U and V. And that's the end of Lecture 31B. Thanks for watching.